And welcome to our Empty House event with Alice Kinsella, David Butler, Catherine Phil McCarthy and Breda Wall Ryan, brought to you by South Dublin Libraries as part of our Poetry Day Ireland celebrations. Be sure to check out the rest of our Poetry Day Ireland events throughout the whole day and watch back any events you've missed on South Dublin Libraries YouTube channel. Your libraries may be closed, but we're still here with a whole range of library services and you can join online right now at www.southdublinlibraries.ie. On behalf of South Dublin Libraries, please enjoy our Poetry Day Ireland event, Empty House. And now I'm going to hand you over to host and co-editor of the anthology, Alice Kinsler. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Alice Kinsler and along with my colleague Nessa Omani, I'm the co-editor of Empty House. Please allow me to introduce our three poets this evening. I'm joined by Catherine Phil McCarthy, David Butler and Breda Wall Ryan. David Butler's second poetry collection, All the Barbaric Glass, was published in 2017 by Thera Press. His 11 poem cycle, Black Rock Sequence, the Percent Literary Arts Commission, illustrated by his brother Jim, won the World Illustrators Award in 2018. Catherine Phil McCarthy has published five collections of poetry and a novel, most recently Daughters of the House 2019 and The Invisible Threshold 2012, both from Daedalus Press Dublin. She received the Lawrence O'Shaughnessy Award for Irish Poetry from the University of St. Thomas, St. Paul, Minnesota in April 2014. She's a former editor of Poetry Island Review and has lived in Dublin since 1987. Breda Wall Ryan lives in Bray, County Wicklow. Among her many awards are the Gregory O'Donoghue International Poetry Prize, Dermot Healy International Poetry Award and the Shine Strong Award. A founder member of Hibernian Poetry, her collections, both from Dara Press, are In a Hair's Eye 2015 and Raven Mothers 2018. Thank you all very much for being here. Um, so we're going to have a chat about, um, about Empty House now. Um, a bit of the background about Empty House. We're, we're here to talk about the anthology, which is Poetry and Prose on the Climate Crisis. Uh, Empty House was published on April 22nd, which was Earth Day. And of course, the reason behind the anthology is uh, the climate crisis. So this anthology came about as I wanted to do something, anything really on climate action. I approached Lisa from Thera Press as I was an, um, a, a big fan of their work and she wanted to do the same. Um, Empty House came about as a way for writers to show their concern for and reflect on the climate crisis in the hope that a level of awareness could be encouraged throughout our community. And through this anthology, we were able to make a donation to Friends of the Earth Ireland. Friends of the Earth are doing fantastic work and uh, we want to be able to support them in, in any way. Um, so for, for me anyway, the, the background um, anxiety for a long time and then quite suddenly it became a matter of urgency to feel like I was involved in some action, um, I suppose. So I'd love to know what each of your experiences were in um, of the climate crisis for the last couple of years and before you were asked to contribute to the anthology. I will I start, Alice. I yeah, I, absolutely. Jump in there. Yeah. I, I guess I I was in Skocin in Slovenia in 2011, and uh, it was for a translation workshop, and we were taken on a walk, and the person who guided the, the week uh, told us about a storm that had happened in the year before in 2010, where the river levels had gone to 60 feet above what were our heads when we were walking down the riverbed on that particular day. Mm -hmm. And it felt incredibly graphic. Um, that shock, I think, that such a thing could happen and also the devastation that happened around us. Um, and I think the, the other kind of pointer was a friend sitting in my kitchen one day saying, um, and she's a scientist, and I wasn't in hugely aware at the time of habitat depletion, but she said, so what if the human race becomes extinct? And for me, the earth is human. And I couldn't separate out. I, I thought about it a lot after that. And I thought human civilization and the earth are kind of part of each other and indivisible. And I thought, isn't it terrible that anybody should think that in a way, because, you know, here we are having had the pleasure of the world we've had. And it would be lovely to pass it on to everybody else in that particular state. So that was kind of 
my thinking. Yeah. Wow, uh, that's a, that's a such an a, an emotional statement, I suppose, isn't it? Um, so so what if the if the world if the if humans weren't around? Um, David, what about yourself? What what was your kind of experience um, of of the climate crisis? Um, before I came the last couple of years when it came so much into focus for the whole world? I've been pretty much aware of it for at least 20 years, I'd say. Um, like I'm very interested in, 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 the, in the natural world and even in paleontology, like, you know, and just the idea that we have a, an extinction crisis at the moment, the sixth one in the history of the Earth, like the sixth extinction point. It's not all climate change, it's also uh, just the population of the Earth exploding and so forth, but I've been aware of it. I only began to address it in, in my fiction to begin with about six years ago. I wrote a story um, about uh, a house that flooded for the third time and how the people were desperate in it. And then in terms of poetry, I'd always addressed nature. I live right by the sea and I'm very aware of how close I am to the sea. So I began then when the call came out from Empty House to, to, to think about how some of the poems address the issue. Uh, so I suppose that's really where I began to engage with specifically what's happening with the climate, you know, in my poetry, which I hadn't done before. So, and then it, it, it's eye-opening just to see the many responses in this collection. It really is. Thank you. That's and um, Brita, I'd love to. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Well, I think. I, I can't pinpoint a time when I actually became aware of climate change, but um, there were little things always. Like my father told me when he was a child that the little the boys in his town used to come out to our farm and lime the branches and trap linnets for the Dublin um, bird market, which existed at the time. And there were no linnets anywhere on the farm. So I thought, um, you know, they've actually decimated the linnets. But my father says, I don't think the weather suits them anyway anymore, you know. And I didn't really think about it very much at the time, to why the weather wouldn't have suited them, why it had changed. But when, when I was a child myself, we used to go to this particular rock beside a brook to watch the lizards sunning themselves. The rock is still there and the brook is still there. But when I took my own children, maybe, oh gosh, it must be nearly 40 years ago now to see the lizards, there were no lizards. And uh, I said it to a friend who was a scientist, he was a zoologist, and he said, well, I don't think it's really warm enough there for lizards anymore, or else it's too hot, one or the other but it's the climate. And again, I didn't think very deeply about it, but then I went to visit my sister in Suffolk. And uh, she said, I said, oh, this is such a gorgeous house. And she didn't own it, but it was a beautiful uh, house right on the sea. And she said, in 20 years, it'll be gone into the sea. And she took me up along the coast to see all the the um, houses having fallen in because of the climate change and the erosion, because the water level was rising so much. And she sh showed me a point where there was a village, there had been a village way out almost on the horizon. And it was all sea, it was all North Sea that I could see. And she said, that's because of the ice, ice melting. But in more recent times, I've become more aware, I think, through poetry. I have a friend, um, Jane Robinson, who is an eco-poet, and she writes a lot about uh, climate change and the damage that's being done to our environment. And I just became more and more aware of it and more and more worried about it. And uh, now I look everywhere, I think, yeah, things are changing. We've got plants that never grew in this country before. And now they're self-seeding everywhere. You know? So it's a big worry. It's always at the back of my mind now. Thank you, Greta. It's, uh, it's very true what you say. I mean, it's, it's easy to kind of people be saying, you know, in a hundred years this and in 
100 years that but so much has changed even in the last two decades um it's a it's a much shorter time frame than we than we think um so in terms of um of the the anthology and kind of the last couple of years um uh what came to mind when you were asked to to contribute a poem to this anthology um thematically i mean what direction were you drawn in? Were you, you know, did you consider, what, was it all doom and gloom, I suppose, or is there, uh, was, was there hope in there as well? Me? Yes, yeah. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I tend to be, I tend to lean towards the doom and gloom anyway. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think that's probably the direction I was drawn in. But um, I thought you know, it's such a, a useful thing to have a whole anthology focused on climate change. It would make people aware. And also the fact that there is poetry and prose and, non and uh, creative nonfiction in it, uh, that, that attracted me too, because I love a book that you can, depending on your mood, dip into a different genre in you. Um, but uh, I thought it was so such a useful and such an important idea, and I wanted to contribute, but I didn't know what to write then. And then I took myself on a, a walk when I get homesick for Cork or Waterford. I go to the Devil's Glen because it sort of uh, echoes some of the woods that I knew when I was younger. And um, uh, I was there was a big storm when I was there big windstorm and all the seeds were flying off the trees and you know how they land under the trees and then they don't really come to anything because they're competing with the, the mother tree and I was thinking about well you know if the climate isn't right they won't grow anyway even if they get carried away to a different area and that kind of gave me the start of the, the door into my poem. Fantastic, thank you, thank you, Breda. And um, Catherine, Phil, you you sent us a couple of poems and such a, a, a gorgeous variety, and um, the the book got its name from from your poem, um, "Empty House" comes from a line in in, in Catherine Phil's poem, which um, I won't spoil. So um, I think she's going to read it for us in a few minutes. Um, did you? What was the first thing that came to mind for you when um, wh when you got the email asking? Uh, to contribute to the anthology, uh, did you kind of think about disaster and and rising sea levels, or um, you know, uh, were were did anything else come up for you thematically before um, you sent send those poems in? I just to start uh, to say congratulations, Alice, on the wonderful introduction because it's incredibly moving and. Um, it was also when when the invitation came in, I felt, yes, it was already a place that I'd been thinking about. And when I published uh, The Invisible Threshold, um, several poems in that had reflected on climate and, uh, you know, a poem like Tour Balalee down in County Galway, um, where the tower, where the AIDS tower had actually flooded. So they, it was already very much in my head and um, and since I, I think one of the wonderful things about this anthology and I've really admired um, Amanda Bell's piece on foraging and the you know there's so much information and it's so very interesting Luca Bloom's piece there's so many there are so many uh, Paula, Paula Meehan's fabulous Irish bear poem so there's there's such an incredible range of material and I think what this book will do is to raise consciousness and and to raise awareness even more and um, so I, I, I salute you and Nessa for getting it started. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, just to ask you, David, um, what kind of themes came to mind when uh, when you were asked to contribute to the anthology? Well, the immediate question that came to mind is, did I want to send in a prose piece or a poetry piece? 
And um, as it happens, there had been a major gorse fire on Brayhead uh, about three years ago, which wiped out an awful lot of the vegetation up there and left it into a very scarred place. And I always find that uh, for me, I write across the genre, but with poetry, it's always the most direct and personal and unmediated. It's directly about things that happen to me. And if I mention my father in a poem, it's my real father, whereas in fiction, it's at one remove. So I wanted to um, give a, an immediate personal response. Therefore, there was that event that was very near. So that's what I wanted to send in, I think which tends to be uh, the Gorse Fire poem. Yeah, and it's a it's a beautiful poem. And do you know if that fire was was set by by a person or um, do you know if it, it occurred naturally, so to speak? It was probably one of those disposable barbecues that kicked it off. But if you remember back then, it was, um, it had been a very, very dry month beforehand, very sunny, dry month. But uh, I mean, one of the few, <laughs> it's not a really a benefit, one of the few things that did happen was the fire was so complete that it uncovered this huge E I or E era sign dating from the Second World War to show if the Germans ever mistook us for England. It is not England, this is, this is Ireland. <laughs> so that was uncovered after all those years. But uh, you know, there, were, there was a lot of things threatened. I mean, there were houses threatened by this, you know, and um, it was one of a number of, of fires all around the country, you know, so. Mm. That's why I, as I say, I decided to go that way. Yeah, well, burning gorse and is a, it's common, isn't it? And the, the accidentally set fires um, to, to clear it each year. Um, okay, thank you very much. I think we're going to have some some readings and um, some poems now, which is, is why we're here after all. Um, so to, to start us off, I'm going to read two poems from the anthology. Um, the first one is by Jessica Trainer. Um, this poem really resonated with me. It's a it's a beautiful poem by an incredible poet. Um, and it's called Walrus. As we strip wallpaper layers from the box room, a pattern emerges. The walrus, the carpenter, a chorus of oysters. Toe-headed Alice looks on. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things. So sleep, child, in your new room, second beloved of these walls. Sleep as the sun rises and ice melts. And for want of the freeze, a walrus pushes further up a cliff face. Of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. O oh, Eggman, O oh, incongruous beast, wallowing uphill before tumbling, pole sinked towards sea to its rock broken herd at the cliff base and why the sea is boiling hot and whether pigs have wings sleep child sleep as I browse washing machines and the ball of tears at my throat dribbles with detergents down the drain more beauty broken in an eye flash flickered blink than I can ever tell you um it's heart-wrenching stuff, especially considering long after this this poem was um was written and and put in the book, a walrus turned up in Valencia, Ireland, in Kerry, <laughs> much further south than it should be. So um the there's a, a it's a kind of a premonition in this poem. Um and the second poem I'm going to read is um by an absolutely fantastic poet, Anne Tannum. And the uh, fun fact is that it inspired the, the beautiful artwork that is included in Empty House by artist um, Catherine Gavin. And um, so this is a poem, it's called Come Knocking, it's by Anne Tannum. In the beginning, the signs are easy to miss. A fish carcass rotting behind the garden shed Tide marks on the skirting board, her boots in the back of the wardrobe, mildewed and briny. On Monday, the dog goes missing. Tuesday, every plant in the garden dies. In the greenhouse, water rises steadily. Crabs hide behind cabbages. Small fish dart between tomato plants and French beans. On Wednesday, the fridge empties itself. 
Thursday, she dreams herself into the body of a sea lion, night passing in a silent blue blur of endless hunting. The metallic taste of blood in her mouth when she rises, ravenous, teeth aching, jaw stiff. On Friday, the power shuts down. Saturday, she wakes to roaring in her ears, the weight of a million square feet of ice crashing into the swollen, rising sea. On Sunday, darkness spreads over the deep. Um, so again, that was that was comes knock come comes knocking by um by Anne Tannum, which is just what a powerful powerful poem. Um, it's always difficult to do justice to someone else's poem reading it, and there's nothing quite like hearing a poem read by the poet themselves, which is what we are very lucky to have now. Um, Catherine Phil, could I ask you to share your poem with us, please? Thank you. I feel very honoured that the title of the collection is drawn from this poem, Night Sky. Paint at night, those stars in a frosty sky, one brighter than another. Sirius, Orion, Great Bear, accustom eyes to deepest pitch that delivers the Milky Way. The more it's scanned, this sprawl grows fathomless. Too late to catch low in the south, as if the sound made walking the lane just now frightened it away. A star falling, and seconds later, another lit trajectory scorching headlong over the western rim. Yet, up above, the heavens are crammed with constellations like so many freckles jostling for place. Could it be some night we are not there, gone without trace, planet Earth, an empty house. As the face of night prevails, unforeseen and certain from the beginning, as only death is. The next poem I will read is A Scotian Journey, and uh, I mentioned that um, I was in Slovenia in 2011, and Scotian is a limestone karst region, and it's very like the burn, and the Reka River there runs overground and then drops and it, through a channel and then runs underground for about 18 kilometers before it enters the sea. This is Scotian journey. Across the bleached stepping stones, river down to a soundless trickle, lazy pools lukewarm in the shade. We speak of the rains that flooded the canyon last summer. Trace the high water mark by driftwood sticks high above our heads. A tangle in branches of a linden, like the nest of some great bird. Eagle or peregrine falcon, we've seen riding the thermals in pairs above the cliffs. Four skyward, circling into Asia further than the eye could see. Or maybe a crane, last glimpsed with fox in the fresco of a tiny church. Black, the magnesium line stains limestone walls way up, so that even now a tumult rages, and we are treading the Reka riverbed, hands loosening our boots while we float free, water sprites in the chasm of a deep rush our hair standing on end amidst a melee of drowned debris, branches of morello and plum, berries of wild fruit, stalks of flowering cyclamen, lizard, snake and wolf, all swept past the broken mill wheel, through the gorge mouth, down and down through timeless caves, where only this river flows coursing into the underworld. Thank you. That's 
just incredibly um incredibly moving thank you those last few lines of um of the poem that is in, included in the anthology is just a complete you know pump to the chest every time it was uh it's one of those real yeah when 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 we read it it was um the title of the book just seemed it seemed made for it it was um it's a really really gorgeous poem and it says so much thank you um Thanks, Alice. David, would you? Sorry. Sometimes I think we have to name the worst, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what that's what it's doing, and that things will change radically. Thank you, David. Would you please um share a poem or two with us? Sure. Yeah. Um. The the, the poem Horse Fires. It's actually the fourth part of a. Uh, a sequence of poems called Weather Gods, which deal with different aspects, I suppose, of climate, climate change. So I'll read that to begin with, Weather Gods. Tired of burnings, bulldozers, charred lungs. Shack the rain god to camps from Mayan rainforests. Rise the bloated trade winds, comes to rain over the old world. Days on end, the swollen earth has swallowed till it's soaked as blotting paper. The sun is an aspirin dissolving in a gauze of soaked cotton. Storm drains clog, rivers turn reptilian. Shed the alluvial taint in basements, swell to bursting. Silver place the floodplains. Jack moves over the face of the waters. Looks on desolation wrought by man. Calls up the brother elements. Part two. The drunken wind which last night stomped through the playground drove the park into a frenzy of soughing boughs, buffeted the houses, sputtered down the throats of chimneys, chased cascades of startled leaves against the windows, has, this morning, taken a breather. The ground is littered with all the detritus of late autumn, as if a carnival has decamped, and the trees, stripped bare as parents when grief tears through them, are suddenly old. Part three, there's a moment between drought and downpour when the winds hold their breath, the boughs stop moving, the cloud backlit is photographed still, the sea's meniscus reverent, a moment in suspense, an instant when future imperfect appears to hang in the balance, when the dice have yet to fall, the first fat drops to explode in the dust tormented earth. And part four. Weeks on, the scorched stench persists. Beyond the cowering header, the rusted fern and brackens burnt Sienna, a blackened heath. Something else subsists beneath the ocean sibilance and gulls' psychotic squabbles, the absolute silence of death. Bitterness of ash, the whitened cans, the charred bones of gorse imploring like something from Purgatorio, an image out of Aleppo, are a lesson from our own past, the whole head pitch cup. Um, the second poem I'd like to read is somebody else's. It's from the anthology Empty House, and it's a poet I very much admire um, down in Cork. Um, Victoria Kenefick, and it's called One Being Two in the Anthropocene. Um, I hope I do it justice. I am a sea and you are a bird. You're not a baby but a big girl holding my face in your soft little claws. You are a lark and you are singing hello. Mama and Baba are big girl rocking like we used to. You were a bird, a baby, a baby bird, all cosy, only to leap off my lap nest and blow kisses to house spiders. I am not scared of them, you say. I am not scared of them either, I parrot. I think that's what you're supposed to do, echo them. We like spiders, I say. They live with us. I have diligently shown you their webs, hugging corners of cloudy windows. Beyond our little thumbprint of garden lies unmowed. 
It is the bug's house. We must not wash them, you say. And butterflies, why do they wear makeup, Mama? I am conscious then of my face, of what I hide with my face. All summer, your chubby cheeks are slicked white with sunscreen. There's your hat tossed like a petal on the grass. The neighbors pass. We explain our untended plot is intentional. They smile tightly and nod. We tell the caretaker to skip our patch. I still run after you, pick things up. When you nap, I watch the snip, snip, snip. When you don't, we walk slow loops around the wetlands. I get sad when they cut the grass, you pipe up, your hand glued to mine. I do too, I say. That is a magpie, one for sorrow, always wave it away. You are tired, I carry you. I imitate lark sounds, it is not enough. The nests are empty. I get sad when hedgerows are ripped out like insulation from a rotting house. I get sad as earth becomes sea. I get sad that in showing you this sinking world, I'm teaching you how to say goodbye to it. Which I think is an absolutely stunning poem. Um, okay, that's me done, thanks. Thank you, thank you so much, David. Um, they, 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 it is an absolutely stunning poem. It really, it really is. And your own, you've got some of the most wonderful turns of phrase um, yourself, David, um, I'm still, I still smile over those psychotic squabbles. Brita, <laughs> um, we'd love to we'd love to hear your poems. Okay. This first one, as I said, came while well, it was prompted by an experience in the Devil's Glen, which is a lovely wilderness glen in County Wicklow. If the climate comes right, one. This abundance of devil's glen trees tumble down the ravine. Crowns rake the storm with a riverine crash. Seed pods, ash keys, sycamore wings. Seedlings and acorn cups swirl down to wait for squirrel or bird or boot cleat to carry them clear. These hedgehogs find burrs will grow to a sweet chestnut grove to yield 20 years hence, if the soil gets a good snap of frost, if it doesn't heat up too early in spring, if a flood doesn't sweep the topsoil away, if crop spray doesn't drift on the wind, if the white catkins bloom, if bees swarm to the pollen-rich flowers, if the seas don't encroach, if the climate comes right. Two, screens show us forests on fire, a beach cut off by barbed wire, landfill leaching into the bay. Jettisoned nets tangle gull bone, shed feathers, seal skull, rope, fish kill, bleach track, driftwood, sea glass, a fin whale blunders up river to die. A storm addled seal hauls out and births a white pup on the urban foreshore. We admire the wee creature, such sorrowful eyes, deplore the unseasonal weather, unaware that the petrol we burn and our gas eated homes cause change that can never come right. And the second poem I'd like to read for you was written by Geraldine Matt Mitchell, a poet I admire a lot. And I like this poem for its detail, but also for the undercurrent of catastrophe that's behind it. Wool for Weaving by Geraldine Mitchell. That was the year thread went scarce. Yarn for binding, mending, fixing. Wire was hard to come by, thin ropes or twine in skeins and hanks. The year after that, seams burst open, 
souls came away from their uppers. It was the year of no containment, when seas overflowed with plastic, when fish choked on the finger bones of children, and beach attendants went on strike because the dead would not pay. That year, they began to bottle tears, archive mothers' cries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Brida. That was truly wonderful to hear and uh, and, and beautifully read. Um, so I might um, bring back a, a bit of just a discussion now. We're all here today chatting um, because we're all involved with Empty House, um, which uh, uh, in, in case you've somehow have managed to miss it yet, uh, is this anthology um, on the theme of the climate crisis and it is available on therapress.com. Um, so the climate crisis is, is only going to become more pertinent in the coming years. And um, so I've, I've got a, a couple of quotes here. This is from the, the UN's website. Um, no corner of the globe is immune from the devastating consequences of climate change. Rising temperatures are fueling environmental degradation, natural disasters, weather extremes, food and water insecurity, economic disruption, conflict and terrorism. Sea levels are rising, the Arctic is melting, coral reefs are dying, oceans are acidifying and forests are burning. It's clear that business as usual is not good enough. As the infinite cost of climate change reaches irreversible highs, um, now is the time for bold collective action. So in the early days of the development of the anthology, um, we were talking about climate change and uh, an anthology for climate change is what we wanted to do. But as we went on, it changed to the climate crisis. Uh, it was only talking to friends of the earth that I realized that the language around this environmental change was incredibly important, that change um, can suggest something natural or unproblematic, but that this is, it's important to acknowledge that this is an emergency. Um, talking about collective, action and the importance of the language we use around the climate crisis. Um, I'd love to talk about has, how speaking with, with other people and with other writers in particular, um, how has this affected how you feel about the climate crisis um, or inspired you in, in any way to, to, to act or, or live differently? Um, anyway, uh, this is for, for everyone just to talk. <laughs> I guess I, I, I think planting trees is a great initiative that has already started in Ireland, and I was really delighted to see that on Nationwide about two or th two weeks ago. Now I think it was the the planting of oaks across the country and the way in which they're being disseminated through local communities and clubs, and um, I know that if everybody in the country planted at least six trees if every single person did that I, I keep thinking of things we can just do individually that might actually make a difference um and i think also rivers are particularly vulnerable and in ireland i think having a proper waste management system in rivers i think there are still i think it's still being addressed but when you look up Irish water and you look at the number of towns on the coast that still don't have a waste management system and not even just necessarily on the coast but it's it's kind of shocking so I, I guess those are things that the country and the government really really need to take on and and need to do that very rapidly um I I was particularly moved by the recent David Attenborough uh, program life on our planet and um, where he addresses the, the kind of depletion of species since he started making programs and um, I guess to see somebody with that authority and of that age really deciding we really have to change I think it's it's very very persuasive so that's yeah, I'd say that a lot of what we can do, I suppose, at a very small level, um, it seems to me that we're living in an age 
over the last 20 years where uh, people tend to believe the bubble of the social media that they are part of and they tend to go down little rabbit holes of conspiracy theories or whatever you want to call them. There's an awful lot of disinformation. There are an awful lot of climate deniers. Um, I, I find it hard to believe that somewhere like the, the United States voted in Trump, who was immediately going to pull out of the, of the Paris Accord, or Brazil would vote in you know, Bolsonaro, who was going to absolutely start destroying the Amazon. So the more we can, I, I don't just mean poets, I mean, I mean, we who care about this can in some way contribute to the discourse, be it through social media, be it through publications like this, be it just through raising awareness to make the deniers more and more a minority, the, the more important it'll be. I mean, I, I'm, I'm looking across like at what's happening in Europe at the moment. They reckon that in the next election in Germany, the Greens might be the biggest party. Now that's going to be a first, you know what I mean? So, you know, that, that's the sort of way that the pendulum will swing. And it doesn't necessarily come from political soapboxing. It comes from, you know, grassroots and groundswells and artistic people and songs and protests and things like that. And I think we can all be part of that. And I think that is one of the hopeful things. Like, you know, obviously Trump is gone. I'm hoping that very soon Bolsonaro will be gone in, in Brazil. So little by little, I, I think as, as people who have grown up, the, the Greta Thunberg sort of generation are growing up, who are so aware of this, I think um, politicians would be shot down if they don't embrace a green agenda. I really hope that'll happen anyway. Yeah, absolutely. You make a really important point um, about being a part of the a part of the discourse, even just because it's it's very difficult to look at it and think that the one person can do anything or that you know that the, all these small um, acts, such as the the lawn in Victoria's poem, um, they're not just it, it's not just the 20 or 30 or 100 I don't actually know how many bees would feed up a, a, a lawn but it's not just that individual um garden it's the message that that is sending out it's normalizing it being a part of a conversation it's you know even if you just think of um how littering might be normal in a town until someone or the tidy towns committee or or our local school children um you know go that's that's not okay and it just spreads in the same way that something like COVID um, can spread so quickly, so can positive things, uh, I hope. <laughs> I think that as individuals, there's probably a lot we can do. And even though as individuals, we can't make a huge difference, we can bring others along with us. And as you mentioned, the lawns, when I was in West Cork two years ago now, I saw a lot of people had let their lawns turn white clover and it smells heavenly. And it was full of bees and it stays quite short, the white clover. So you don't need to mow so often. I think that should introduce it in the cities and even, you know, pay for the seeds for people. And that would make a big difference, big difference too kind of your feeling of well-being when you smell the white clover and big difference to the bees who need the nectar from it. And I think also maybe uh, if at local level you had to apply for planning permission to put in hard landscaping in your garden, to pave your garden, for instance, if you had to apply for permission, permission and it was just as difficult as it is to get permission to build a conservatory or an extension or a, you know, a doghouse or whatever, that that would make a big difference too. People would think twice because the hard landscaping means the water has the rain, has nowhere to soak into and it just runs off into the gullies, into the streams, into the, the sea, because we don't treat it. And that's causing a big problem as well. Um, 
And I can't think of any other things offhand that I think the individual can do. But if you look after the part of the earth that's under your control, and if everybody did it, we really would have a much better world. Yeah. I was at my son's house at the weekend and I foraged lots of nettle tips one day to make soup. And of course they thought I was nuts, my children, because they hadn't had it before, but they have now. And the next day I got lots and lots of sorrel. Sorrel is wonderful. You pay a fortune for it in the market. It grows wild. Just don't pick it all, leave some to grow on. You know, these are little things. When the berries come out, I'll be out after that too. But I'll leave some for the birds. So I think all those little things, they make your quality of life much better, but they also make the quality of life for everybody else much better. And they make it better for the earth that we are the custodians of at the moment. Okay, that's the end of my preaching for today. <laughs> No, that's lovely. And that's such a, it is, it's such a positive um, way of looking at it as well, because it, it does increase your own personal quality of life to, to kind of engage in your, in your, your own environment and the, this, the patch of earth that, that you live on. And just by making it the norm as well to act like that, it will, it will spread and it will, like David said, um, make politicians aware that this is what their, their, um, I can only think of the word congregation. I don't think that's the right one. <laughs> um, what their what their voters want, um, and and little by little that will make a that will make a difference. Um, and so we couldn't have um, a discussion about about poetry and the the climate without talking about eco poetry. Um, poets have been engaging with the environment and nature for for centuries. Um, nature poetry was of course it was popularized by the romantics but now we're in the 21st century and we're again seeing a rise in the popularity of poetry with the natural world as its central subject uh, eco poetry uh, is only a term that's been popularized in the last couple of decades and it is different from nature poetry according to craig santos perez in his essay for the georgia review teaching eco poetry in the time of climate change um, he says, eco-poetry generally refers to poetry about ecology, ecosystems, environmental injustice, animals, agriculture, climate change, water, and even food. It emerged in the 1990s as poets questioned the naturalness of nature poetry, especially since nature itself was rapidly changing due to global warming and environmental destruction. While nature poetry um, is often about the appreciation of the beauty of nature and how it makes the poet feel, eco-poetry is, is something else entirely. In his article in Poetry Magazine, John Shoptal said, an eco-poem is environmental, is that it is ecocentric, not anthropocentric. Uh, human interest cannot be the be all and end all of an eco-poem. So what, um, to, to, to ask, ask you all, what do you think eco-poetry, um, what role do you think it will be playing going forward or indeed with the climate crisis, um, what role will the climate crisis play in, in the future of poetry? <laughs> um, well, I, I might just begin with um, a thought. Just going right back to uh, when I was a teenager many years ago. And it, by that definition, this wouldn't be an ego poem, but it's one of the poems that really struck me as a 12 or 13 year old um, as throwing a light on what was happening and I, I can I can I couldn't quote from it I can remember the poem well it's a Philip Larkin poem where he's just imagining the rate at which humans are kind of expanding towns in England and he's, he's just getting this I mean he never had kids himself but he, he's getting this faint, faint feeling of nervousness about the number of roads and the number of suburbs and so on and this feeling that England is finite there's only so much land and there's a concern that at some stage it'll all be concreted over and now if eco poetry shouldn't be you know anthropocentric it's not an eco poem but to me it is an eco poem because it really you know as i say like you know 40 years later i still remember this poem i still remember coming across it 
And I think, you know, it, it did a lot speaking out then. He would have written that, I suppose, in 1960, maybe, you know, 60 years ago. It, it was kind of ahead of its time to a certain extent. And then the other thing uh, that really made an impact on me was when I first came across Uncle Vanya by Chekhov, which would have been written in the 1890s. Um, and that's really all about the destruction of woods and forests in Russia. He was way ahead of his time, you know, writing that. It actually originated as a play called The Wood Demon about this Dr. Astrov who's just totally concerned that no one is caring for the environment. You know, I mean, if you wrote that now, it wouldn't be surprising. But to write that in the 1890s was surprising, you know. Absolutely. And I, I'm, I do, there are, there definitely seem to be conflicts in, um, even in the two definitions that I read there about what would be considered eco poetry and, oh, and yeah. not. Um, and, and I definitely, I, I would agree with the, the Philip Larkin poem being, being eco poetry because um, I suppose even the way I would see it is even if the, it's not necessarily the humans concerns or their welfare, but the, the impact they're, they're having. Um, Responsibility, sure. Yeah. <laughs> or lack of. <laughs> I think our, our relationship, I, I guess I would never have thought of myself simply as a nature poet, um, so that it's always um, nature and, and civilization and human relationships are so important. And so I think when poetry came to me early on, um, the sense of place and the celebration of, of place and that's hedgerows and bogs and rivers and um, all around where I grew up as a child. And um, so I guess I find it very hard to just separate out uh, the, the sense of the movement, because I think Robert Frost's idea of poetry as a stay against confusion, it's I think when we write at the moment and lament the state of the planet, it's not wanting that to get the to have the last word. I think there is some attempt in a way to bring it to a standstill and to move things in the opposite direction. And maybe also to be able to celebrate, because I think that's important at the same time to ce celebrate nature and the world around us quite. But I think the, our relationship to it definitely has to be adjusted. I, I think the, the idea of mastery is, doesn't, doesn't make any sense at all to me. So, I, 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 and I think that's, that's been the problem in a way that, that, that human beings have maybe thought of themselves as masters of, in the earth. And I think that they're in a way, to kind of imagine oneself and, and human beings as just another animal on the planet and one that we share with other beings. Mm. And that adjustment going forward is one, I think. Yeah, because it is, it's the, it's the reality, isn't it? Even kind of re remember growing up and seeing the, the food chain and, and things like that. And it was never, that was, that was something that, that we imagined as a species. <laughs> and uh Frida, how do you think um, eco poetry and the presence of it is going to change the poetry that we see being written and being published in the next in the next few years? I think that we'll see more eco poetry in the sense of the poets bearing witness to what is being done to the exploitation uh, for the sake of profit, and um, I think that's very, very important, but I think it's also important for the eco poets to be aware of the science behind what is happening and maybe to predict uh, to shock people into taking stock and having second thoughts. I mean, it makes no sense at all to for politicians to uh, pay huge subsidies to farmers to grow more food which they can't sell i mean we could give it away but 
it, there is no need for it. We don't need all this food, not in this country, not in the place where it's being produced. It's needed elsewhere. Um, but I think maybe uh, poetry, eco poetry has got a shock value. And I've noticed a lot of people who are, who would say, I'm not really interested in poetry, uh, but listen to this. And it'll be an eco poem and it will have a shock value and it'll make you think. And I think that's a very important function of poetry at the moment. Absolutely, it's, it's, that says it all, doesn't it? It's um, to make you think. Um, to, that's the, the power of, of literature. Um, I think we have time for, for one, more, one more poem from, from each of you. Um, and thank you very much for, for that really engaging discussion. Um, if you'd be so kind to read one more poem each, um, we could start with, with you, Bridget. This, uh, this is a poem that is uh, poet to be written from the year 2060. And it was prompted by Larry Schweiger, who said, there will be no polar ice by 2060. Somewhere along that path, the polar bear drops out. And this is imagining that time. Now that the white bear is gone. Now that the white bear is gone, the witch of the north clears a window in the ozone. She expands the oceans. Amphibious, they bask on lowlands, offer cold blood to the fire king invade the nomads campground in the territories of the whale. We have worshipped the Isaac, traded people and country for black gold invested for scorching day. We dole coffee spoons of melt water to infants and parched elders. Lovers pledge on dying love in high carrot ice chips, raise snow cones in terrible toast. We have eaten the salmon of knowledge, sacrificed a puny glacial calf. The flames of our oil wells mock us, the waters rise up against us, our own creations destroy us splinters from the one true ice cap are relics we pay diamonds to touch. Lightkeepers hold vigils for a glimpse of the rumoured saviour, fingernailed to a passing flow. That's it. Um, that was, that was um, beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, that's very moving. Um, David, might you read us a poem? Sure, yeah. Uh, when, when, I, when I sent in the biography to Empty House, <laughs> for some reason I forgot to mention that I have a poetry collection coming out this year with Dura Press, um, Liffey Sequence is called. So this is a poem from Liffey Sequence. Um, I think we're going to become more and more aware that we're cohabiting with creatures, even in our cities. And we have been for a hell of a long time as our cities grow. So this is, it's entitled Liffey Boardwalk, but it's really the Liffey or Dublin as seen from the point of view of gulls, those perennial habit, inhabitants of Dublin. Liffey Boardwalk. Single file, they line the rail and I, the blow-ins, are ride a wave of falling air to scrap over a sodden crust. They're bickering, old as Viking gutturals and the march of Cambro Normans. Seagulls are the first citizens of a town built on scraps. Shane and Manacle dug from tidal loam. Claymore, Hike, English musketry, they've seen it all. Farther down, a drunken spat erupts over beer cans. And who's to say it hasn't all the bitterness of civil war? The gulls are unmoved. The wind shifts, the tide changes.
that was um that was beautiful thank you very much and and congratulations on your your upcoming collection when when do we expect to see that uh i'd say september or october it'll be fantastic. late autumn anyway fantastic looking forward to it and um, catherine phil would you would you please read for us yes uh i'd like to read river talk uh siobhan campbell's poem in empty house river talk when i step into the tar black flow under the fur beam of pussy willow my legs fill with surfacing blood each four fights the river cold bones stiffen locking my limbs feet on stones feel for ridges and ribs a slide shift to the one bit of sand and hurrah for me i can stand hello says the slow but steady flow hello i say wary now knowing how it fills the fields leaves a layered skim of gray silt carries salmon to their home runs shucks stones through their spring spawn makes bends where it will, though farmers dredge its banks. Luckily, it hears my deference, allows me to watch until I see where weeds are colored filaments and newts glide by on patterned feet and pink fish, sorry, and pink fish eggs nussle up a future. And all is movement here and all is season, and all is turning, except me, as I would fall down if I did. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a beautiful poem as well, and, and beautifully read. Um, that's, that's us. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this off on, um, with one poem from the anthology. Um, before I go, just want to say thank you very much to um, Catherine Phil McCarthy, Rita Wall Ryan, and David Butler. Thank you guys. Thank you. And thank, thank you also to South Dublin um, Libraries and to Mark and Amy um, behind the scenes. Uh, I'm going to close the event on um, a poem, the opening poem of Empty House, which again is Empty House, and you can find it on thoroughpress.com. Um, and this is by Jane Clark and Skull Scheme. Lifted on Southerlies from sloblands and bogs, louder and louder until they're above us, yodeling and yelping, laughing or weeping. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for joining us and uh, happy Poetry Day.